Okay, so we've got our theorem um, and we've got the idea hopefully now that what the theorem is saying is that if we have this sequence, okay, so whatever that is, if we have this sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables where we've got these restrictions on the parameters. So how can we describe their distributions? We describe their distributions with the parameters mu and sigma squared. If we do this sort of z-score looking expression, okay, it's what it kind of looks like a z-score, right? And we let the number of samples get bigger and bigger and bigger, well, actually not the number of samples, I should say the number of uh, sums, the number of items that we're summing, and uh, so we'll talk more about the details of this expression later. Um, as n goes to infinity, then the probability that our expression is less than some value a can be calculated with the standard normal uh, probability density function. Okay, so I know I, I said I was gonna make it easy to understand. <laughs> so what it means is this, we can use the empirical rule we can use the probability, the probabilities of the uh, Z distribution, AKA the standard normal distribution to calculate probabilities from a wide range of random variables provided that they meet these few requirements, okay? So before we get into the details of what is this expression and everything like that, the first thing we need to understand is sequence. Okay, so that's where we're going to start today. We're going to look at what is a sequence? Um, what does, what, well, actually, because the sequences can be convergent, a sequence can be convergent or divergent. We'll look at what does it mean for a sequence to be convergent and divergent. And then we'll talk, we'll have to talk about sequences of functions. Um, then we're going to talk about what is a random variable and what does it mean the random variable is independent? Then we'll get into what what does it mean for them to, for them to be identically distributed. Hold on, let me. Uh, I'm just going to change my screen share because it's driving me nuts to look over here, <laughs> and it probably looks strange to you. And I I really don't want to uh, record this again. So just please accept this video uh, warts and all, if you don't mind. Okay, that's going to be a lot better. Yeah, there we go. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why I put it over there. All right, so then uh, we have to look at what does identically distributed mean? What? Why do we need finite parameters and what are parameters anyway? And then from there, we'll move on to what is convergence and distribution. So we'll, we've talked in the previous video that there are different types of convergence um, and they have different meanings. And so we'll talk about what is convergence and distribution. We'll talk about what is convergence and probability. We'll talk about what is convergence almost surely. And also we'll have to go back and talk about two ideas from a real analysis called pointwise convergence and uniform convergence. And those are gonna help us in our proof. All right. So then we'll talk about the cumulative distribution function. You might call it the CDF. Um, so what it, the CDF is how we can get the value of the probabilities. And you'll see how it's related to the probability density function, okay? And then we'll talk about something else, a different kind of function called the moment generating function, which we will use also in our proof. Okay, so yeah, so that basically that's it. And so now let me define what is a sequence. And to do that, I'm actually going to use, I'm actually going to write this down like I'm in a classroom or in a tutoring session. All right, so I'm gonna go up here. Let's do a new share. I should be sharing the black screen now. Okay, so first of all, let me give you a definition. Okay. So here is my definition. And actually, let me, maybe I should change it now, it's fine. So here's my definition. A sequence is what I want to define, okay? And what is a sequence? 
the sequence is it's a function. Okay, so it's a function. And we might also see the word mapping being used, mapping. Okay, so a function uh, whose domain is, I'm gonna write this symbol down called in. In is the set of all natural numbers and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so it's a, it's a function whose domain is a set of all natural numbers and we can take this function like this a sub n and we can say that a takes the natural numbers to the real numbers. Okay, now let me go back here and explain these things. So sequence is a function. So what is a function do you remember from uh, algebra or calculus, or maybe you don't remember it, but a function is, it's, it's when you have two sets of items, and let's say I've got A, B, and C here, and one, two, three, and here. A function is a way to pair these items from both of these, we call these sets, okay? So here's a set, here's a set. So a function pairs items in two different sets, but it doesn't just pair them in any way. It pairs them in such a way that every item in the first list, which we call the domain, has only one item that it's paired with. So in this case, I could say F might map A to one, F might map uh, B to two, and F might map c to three, but a function can never, ever, ever map a, b, or c to more than one of the elements in this set, which we call the range. Okay, so each element in the domain has only one element, number, that's when I say element, I mean, it could be a number, it could be a letter, has only one element in the range. And, and actually we could call this the uh, codomain because the range could just be a subset. So the codomain. Okay, so the codomain is where all of these numbers are, where all of these numbers are, one, two, and three are. That's called the codomain. The range would just be the numbers one, two, and three. Okay, so that's the idea behind a function. I don't wanna to spend too much time on it because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bore the people who are <laughs> strong in mathematics, but I also don't want to, Lose the people who are not. See, it's a balancing thing here, this unpacking method. Okay, so the domain I said is the, it's where the, where the values are coming from, where it's, where it's mapping something from here to there. Okay, so domain. So our domain here is in, which is the natural numbers. So the natural numbers, I'm going to define them to be like this. So this is not equals, this means uh, defined. The natural numbers are defined to be, I'm gonna use zero, okay? Zero, one, two, three, and all the way up to wherever I want to stop. So they're only whole numbers, no fractions, no decimals, no negative numbers, okay? And then of course, R, the real numbers are every number you can think of except for a complex number or other kind of field extension, but you don't might know who that is. So the real numbers include the natural numbers, the integers, the rational numbers, the irrational numbers. Okay, so a real number is just any number that you can think of on a number line that you might be familiar with. Okay, so this is kind of a strange definition, right, of a sequence, maybe. Um, here we've got some curly brackets, and this a sub n, this is our what we call our index. Index. So if I have some sequence, so we'll, we'll say let a sub n equal some sequence like this, a1, a2, a3, and then we'll go up to a uh, n. Well, actually, yeah, that's fine. Um, let me just put the curly braces around it. So this could be my sequence. And this n, this just means like the last place or the nth index, and these are the indexes. So what really is a sequence? It's a mapping 
from the natural numbers to R. So right now I'm using very generic terms, right? This mapping means like it's labeling A as one, it's labeling this A as the second A. That's what it means by while we're making the function. The function is applying each of our natural numbers and we're usually starting at one, not zero. Uh, each of our items in our list gets a natural number, which means it gets an order. It puts it in an order, basically. So let me give you another example. So let's say I've got a sequence. Um, let A sub N be equal to one over N. Okay, here's my sequence, right? So clearly my sequence could not start at zero. Uh, or maybe not so clearly. But if my sequence were to start at zero, I would get one divided by zero, which as you may or may not know, you cannot divide one by zero. Why can't you divide one by zero? Uh, because there is no number that I can multiply to zero and get one. <laughs> so zero times anything is zero and never one. So what does that mean? Let me just explain this real quick because everybody is always like, you can't divide by zero. And nobody, I think, well, not many people know why. So why isn't it, why can't you divide by zero? Because there's no number that I can multiply by zero. Like in this case, I'm dividing four by two. How come I can divide four by two? Because there's some number that exists that if I multiply it by two, I get four, right? There's no number that exists that if I multiply by zero, I get one, never gonna happen. So that's why division is not defined for zero. Okay, so that's like a little mathematical uh, tangent. <laughs> side note. So as a side note, this sequence cannot start at zero. But if I want to list the terms, so my my sequence, we said it's a function from the natural numbers to the real numbers. So when n is equal to one, I get one over one. When n is equal to two, I get one over two. When n is equal to three, I get one over three. So you see, I'm just replacing the n with natural numbers and one over four. So in other words, my sequence looks like this, one, one half, one three, uh, one four, and then one over four, not one three, <laughs> one, one half, one third, and one fourth. So this is the idea of a sequence, okay? Now this is a very um, interesting sequence, I think. And one thing that's interesting about this sequence is that what happens when n gets very large, when n gets very large? So if I have n is equal to 500, then I have one over 500. Now, is this number very big or very small? Yeah, it's, it's very small. And if you don't remember how to do fractions, you can think about it like this. Say I have one pizza and I'm, how do, how do I miss? <laughs> I know how to spell pizza. I just wrote two A's for some reason. If I have one pizza and have 500 friends, uh, we're not gonna get very much pizza, okay? <laughs> so we're gonna split it into very, very, very small pieces. So one over 500 is like an incredibly small number, right? And what happens if N gets even bigger? Like N is equal to 5,000 now. I've got one over 5,000, which is even smaller than this, right? And, and, and exactly what happens is, as n gets larger, and if we say we can let n be as large as we want without any maximum value, then what happens is that this, this sequence, one over n, is getting closer and closer to zero. Okay, it never actually will be zero because there's no way you can make this zero. Can't, you know, it just there's no, no number that can make it zero, but we can get incredibly close. What does that look like? Well, let's say it looks like this. Zero, 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 zero. How many zeros can I write down here? How many zeros can you put between uh, this number and say this one? How many zeros can there be? There can be infinitely many zeros. So what we say is like this, the limit, we call it the limit, the limit, meaning that we're taking this letter in and we're letting it represent every natural number 
without a maximal maximum number. It's getting in, it's getting larger and larger and larger without any bound. So there's nothing to keep it from getting larger. If you tell me, hey, I've got the largest natural number, I can always give you, well, what about that one plus one? Okay, so there's always, <laughs> there's no largest natural number. And that, that actually is a very interesting proof. There is no largest natural number. And so we say, let n go to infinity. Then this sequence one over n goes to zero. So the limit is equal to zero, not that this value ever equals zero. Okay, now what does that mean? Huh? Why did I write zero? I don't know why I wrote zero. Wait a minute. Yeah, it's zero because it's correct. On my notes, I wrote something wrong down and it confused me. <laughs> so yeah, so the limit as n goes to infinity is zero. So what that means is that this sequence has a special property meaning that this sequence is convergent. So this is an example of a, a convergent sequence. So what does convergence mean? Well, it means from what we can see here is as, as this value of n gets larger and larger and larger, our our value for one over n, so as, as n goes to infinity, our value for one over n is going closer and closer to zero. So at some point, after some value here, after some index, the distance between our points and, so that let's say I have, um, uh, the distance between maybe my point and some, so let me just write it down like this. As I get further and further along, as n gets larger and larger and larger, it's getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So uh, let me write down the formal definition of convergence here. So what is convergence? We say a sequence. Is said to converge, converge um, if for every for every single number you can think of that's greater than zero. So we're using this Greek letter called epsilon, and epsilon is a very uh, intimidating word in in some mathematics courses when you first take them. But epsilon, it just means like any number, any number bigger than zero, okay? So for every epsilon we can think of that's greater than zero, um, there is, there's some index. There's an index after which, so there's an index and we call the index, we'll call it capital N. There's an index N after which or such that for every for every one of our values in our sequence after that so for each uh, not like that so for each index n that's greater than or equal to n the distance between one of our points and the next one so if i write down like this a minus a sub n was going to be smaller than epsilon so a minus a sub n, it's just meaning like whatever this value is, it's going to be less than epsilon. And I can make epsilon as small as I like. I'll always be able to find that, um, that this distance will be smaller than that epsilon, this distance between this a, which I'll tell you what that's going to be in a moment, and this a sub n. Okay, so there's this index n. After that point in our sequence, our sequence is going along. Is it after one over? Is it after five thousand? Is it after six thousand? Not really sure, but there is some value there. That no matter how small we make this epsilon, okay. So what is epsilon? It's just a number that we can make infinitely small. Okay. So if we let epsilon get infinitely small, but not exactly equal to zero, then it will always be 
larger than the distance between this term in our sequence and this a, which is going to turn out to be uh, what we call our limit. Okay, so we call the limit of our sequence um, a sub n goes to a, or we can write the limit as n goes to infinity from a sub n is equal to a. Okay, so if that happens, so if it's the case that there's some value after which the distance between any of our, any of the items in our sequence and that value are infinitely small, like no matter how small we make it, we can always find this value epsilon bigger than the distance, then we say that that's the limit. So let me try to draw a picture here. See if I can explain this graphically. Okay, so here I've got, oops, I gotta go back to this. I've got my Y, actually, I'll just call this, I'll call this F of N and I'll call this N, okay. So what exactly is happening with this sequence? Um, do it like that. Well, this sequence, it's starting out, let's say this one, two, three, four. So let's say I started at one, and then I would be here at one, okay? And then at two, it's gonna be halfway. So I'm just gonna draw a rough sketch of it, okay? So what's happening is that as I get further along, this thing is getting closer and closer to zero, essentially. You can see that, right? So I'm getting closer and closer and closer to zero. And at some point, At some point in, maybe it's this one, oops, all of my values are gonna be below this line. So if this is in, okay, the big in that I talked about. So all my values will be below this line eventually. And in fact, even if I move this line um, closer, um, there's always gonna be they're gonna be getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together. So infinitely, um, the distance goes infinitely small, but not zero. <laughs> it sounds strange. Okay, so then on the other hand, so this is the idea of convergence, okay? And this is when we talk about that, the, let me bring it back to the, uh, because you're like, hey, wait a minute, this is way more math than I thought, maybe like that. <laughs> um, and you're like, this is not easy to think about. But let me go, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. We go back to the idea that our sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables, they're converging to the uh, standard normal random variable. So I'm just gonna jump ahead just a tad bit here. Um, so it means like something like this. I've got my standard normal random variable here. Hey, what is it? Oh, this one, yeah, this one. So I've got my standard normal random variable. And so the shape of my distribution, as n goes to infinity, it starts to get like closer and closer to the standard normal. So, so that's the idea. So let's see if I can, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make an animation to do that later on. So it starts to converge to that shape of the curve, okay? Which is why we can you do the calculations that we can do. So now I've got one more thing I wanna discuss, and that is the opposite of, diver of convergence, which is divergence. So not every sequence is convergent. So I'll just give you an example. And then I'll stop the video, I think, because I, like I said, I don't want them to be too long. So not all sequences are convergent. Um, and if 
they are not convergent. So if they're not convergent, then they are divergent. So it means that there is no value that they're getting closer and closer and closer to as we let n go to infinity. And we could also go toward the other direction if we if we were allowed to use, um, well, can we use that? Yeah, we can. So we can actually, because our output value, because the function takes the natural number to the real numbers, we can also have negative values. So we could get negatively large, but we couldn't take in negative values. So because we're talking about natural numbers. So look at this uh, sequence. So we'll say let a sub n be equal to negative one to the power of n. Okay, now this is a sequence that is not convergent because as n gets infinitely large, what happens to this thing? Uh, well, let's just take a few of the values. n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, and n equals four. So if n is equal to one, we get negative one this is the right, yeah, to the power of one, which is negative one. If um, n equals two, let me write, let me do it like this, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to want to use these uh, parentheses or brackets, depending on what part of the world you're in. All right, there we go. So let's just put some brackets on there. So if I have negative one, bracket squared, then I'm going to get positive one. And then now if I have, oops, negative one to the power of three, then I get negative one times negative one, that's positive one times negative one. So it's going to be negative one. And in fact, every time the exponent or index, depending on what part of the world you're in, every time the exponent is an even number, I get positive one. And every time the exponent is an odd number, I get negative one. So what's going on with this guy? If I try to graph it, what will it look like? It's actually very interesting. It, this is doing a behavior that we call oscillation. So here's, uh, no, I don't want to use X and Y. So I'm thinking of uh, this. So I'm just going to use, um, f of n and n. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll start like just with that. And now, see if I uh, going to need to do like this. Okay. Oh, one moment. <laughs> I got the wrong one. This one. Okay. Now, here we are. Okay, so here's what happens. If n is one, then we get, here's negative one. Then down here, we're going to get negative one. And then over here, we've got, let me just put the positive one here. So we've got this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. So this thing is not convergent. It's not nice. We can't use this, if this was our distribution, um, we wouldn't be able to use the standard normal distribution to calculate its probabilities. Now, if we went ahead and, um, well, this is a strange, uh, this would be a strange data set, but definitely possible. But if we were to uh, take the sum of it, well, we would just get either zero <laughs> or, or or something. Um, so let, let me not go there. But let me just say that this is a divergent uh, sequence, which is not convergent. Okay. All right. So that's it for today. So what did we talk about today? We just talked about sequences. Okay. Um, we used a mathematical definition of a sequence, which is that it's a function whose domain is the natural numbers and whose codomain is the real numbers. So, but what does that mean in uh, layman's terms? It means that we're just labeling the items in our list. So these numbers, we're labeling, we're labeling them with uh, 
natural numbers. And here we use this, we use this example where I've got this function, this sequence one over n. And so a sub one means that you replace the n with the one, that's our first term, the first term, this is our second term. Okay, and that's how we get all of the terms of our sequence. And the mapping is telling us which one appears where in the list. And then we also get out a real number value. So here's a real number. Notice this is not a natural number, right? We get out, it's a rational number, but it's also a real number. So we get out a real number. So the, we get the two is the natural number that's being mapped to one half in this case. Three is being mapped to one third like this, okay? And we end up with this infinite, it's infinite, right? Because we could just keep going forever. But we saw that if we let n go to infinity, then the limit as n goes to infinity is actually zero for the sequence, meaning that the sequence converges to zero. The sequence converges to zero, meaning that after some index, Basically, the difference between zero and the values in our sequence is infinitely small. So they're not exactly zero, but they might as well be zero. Okay, so that's the idea. And not every sequence converges. You could also have divergent sequence. And so why do we care about convergence and sequences? Because this is what we have to prove. We have to prove that if we take these random variables sequence that's independent and identically distributed. And we have these particular parameters that are describing the distribution that those, uh, that sequence will converge to the standard normal random variable distribution. So, so that we'll be able to use that probability density function, that cumulative distribution function associated with the standard normal random variable to calculate probabilities. Okay, so that's it for today. Hopefully this was helpful, and I'll see you next time in part three. Thanks so much.